Alright, you filthy weeaboo, so you want to build an anime girl in real life. Or maybe you want to build an anime boy if you swing that way. It doesn't matter too much, they both have very similar features despite the gender difference. But we'll focus on anime girls because that's the meme. Well, usually the meme specifies anime cat girls or Nikos, but we have those kinds of costumes already, so that's not really the part that requires a lot of work. The part that requires a lot of work is the cartoon part. The first thing we're gonna have to do is make several scientific breakthroughs in the realm of genome editing. Anime girls typically have huge eyes, disproportionate heads, and a few miscellaneous stylistic features. So we're also going to have to figure out ways to make these changes in such a way that it does not create disastrous unintended biological issues such as the numerous respiratory problems that can be observed in pugs from selective breeding. Speaking of which, the most obvious change is the near deletion of the nose. Without a secondary way to breathe, our specimen will have to breathe out of their mouth 24-7. I don't think you want that, so we'll minimize the structure as much as we can, and still have those holes. The second is the eyes. The eyes of your typical anime girl are about four times the eyes of your average human. Big eyes are often seen as cute and appealing. The eyes of a baby are disproportionate to their head in a similar way, and much more extreme eye-to-head ratios can be seen elsewhere in the animal kingdom, even in a primate. The Tarsier monkey has large eyes that have evolved to see nocturnally. Unfortunately, it can't actually move them. So it also has the ability to move its head 360 degrees. So we'll have to put a specialized joint in the neck of our creation. There is also the concern of dust, rain, and other debris getting into these eyes easier because of their increased surface area. So let's give our character a pair of safety glasses and call it a day. Most vertebrate eyes are spherical, which means for a larger outside appearance, the rest of the eye that is hidden must also take up significant room. This means the brain is going to have to be pushed back a few inches. The overall shape of the head in anime characters is surprisingly diverse, so we may not actually have to do much about that. All we'd have to do is reduce the chin and we can get an approximation. That is, of course, if you don't want to include the numerous illustrated anatomical inventions that are either downright impossible, or if made possible, they would not be very ideal for our purposes. Now add a spoonful of exaggerated emotional outbursts and ridiculous hair, and our creation is complete. Finally, after thousands of years of human civilization, philosophy, art, and science, all of it leading up to this moment, the peak of our evolution, the greatest development of the modern age. Oh boy, I have fundamentally screwed this up, haven't I? Let's say that without all the endless biological and ethical issues, we could create a three-dimensional recreation of this creature that was living and breathing. That probably wouldn't satisfy the dream of an anime girl in real life because of the uncanniness of converting 2D to biological 3D. The closest thing we can get to that now without it being creepy as hell is just a girl with a similarly smooth facial structure and some makeup. And even that is still slightly uncanny. For the future, honestly, I would put my investment in robotics, where those biological concerns don't matter, and ethical concerns are at least lessened significantly. Now, I'm willing to bet that there are some people out there who earnestly want a genetically engineered cat girl, or anime girl, or raven, or whatever in real Real life. It isn't just a meme to some people. It's still real to me, damn it! I believe what a majority of those people want is a cartoon. Here's what I'm getting at. Furries, for the most part, don't actually want human-animal hybrids. They want cartoon human-animal hybrids. Just look at the endless artwork, the hundreds of fursuits out there. You'll find that a vast majority of them aren't realistic depictions of the merging of a human and an animal species. It's humanoid animals with typically cartoon eyes, brightly colored fur, absurd patterns. Furries weren't producing terabytes of fan art and overwhelming theaters and droves for cats. They were doing that for Zootopia. You can say that cat special effects are bad, which they are, but their anatomy is much more feasible than this or this. I have a theory that there's more of an overlap between people who are attracted to cartoons and people who are attracted to cartoon animals than it seems. I believe it's basically the same mechanism in the brain. 
The term for this sexual attraction to cartoons is shedophilia. However, one can also be infatuated with a cartoon character in a non-sexual way, but in a way that is more intense than just enjoying watching that character on television. This development is interesting to study because there's just a lot more animation and art around than there was even 50 years ago, and there's a lot more outlets to share these more personal feelings. For hundreds of years, we've been developing more and more ways to immerse ourselves in fiction. For thousands of years, we had oral history to tell stories, and then writing and illustration, which allowed for lengthier, more detailed fiction and greater consistency. Then we invented film, which gave fiction moving visuals and the ability to edit real life in any way we wanted to. And then we developed video games, where we could then take these fictional worlds and be able to interact with them. The next step will inevitably be the development of physical sensations from these interactions. This is where things become concerning. Have you ever seen a film of a fantasy world and thought, wow, I would really like to live there? Sometimes I feel this about Ghibli films, where the blending of different technological eras is seamless and magical, the landscapes are green and sunny, the people are all beautiful and charming. You take a look at these worlds, and sometimes it kind of stings just how perfect they are compared to the one you live in now. Even our fictional dystopias seem better. The megalopolis and overall tech oppression of Blade Runner, while supposed to be portrayed as bleak, is dense with a beautiful atmosphere serenaded by Vangelis, is colored by haunting neon, and is filled with just endless coolness. While our real life dystopia is, well, kind of lame. And as our films and video games become more accessible to larger and larger populations, with more and more emphasis on immersion, you can get phenomenon such as Shortly after the release of the film Avatar, a post was made on the Tree of Souls Avatar fan forum, titled, How to Cope with the Depression of the Dream of Pandora Being Intangible, where people vented about how they felt genuinely depressed they could not exist on the planet Pandora. Some even admitted they contemplated suicide, dreaming about how they would be rebirthed as a Na'vi. Shortly, over a thousand posts were made expressing their disgust with the non-idyllic state of planet Earth, and with the human race. Now, I'm not using the term depressed in a clinical sense. I think there's a lot of hyperbole going on here, especially because it's the internet. But I can definitely relate to feeling disgust with the human race. There are good reasons to be disgusted with the human race. The amount of needless waste we create and general disregard for the environment is still a problem. Our culture puts way too much importance in collecting possessions and accumulating wealth than we should. And people are usually way too emotionally invested in meaningless crap and suck to be around. But the solution to all of those issues is definitely not to give up and escape to artificial worlds. However, I can understand. Avatar is an interesting movie because of the technological lengths it went to to make people immersed in its world, on a scale larger than any movie before it. So I can see why people could experience sadness from it. The only reason I find their reactions comedic, personally, is that in my opinion the storyline is generic and the world is filled with many concepts and creatures that I find kind of silly looking. But again, I understand the core idea. Anime girls are designed to be appealing. They're designed to be cute. It's no wonder, really, that some people feel like real girls or boys just can't compare. But there might also be something underneath that surface level attraction. Let's have a thought experiment. How do you know when a person is attracted to you? Well, um, it, uh, it, it kind of depends. Well, it, it um, a body language, I guess? How do you know when a cartoon is attracted to you? Oh, well when they have hard eyes. Or if we go back half a century, this. Now that's a generalization on both sides, but I think you get the point. The emotions of cartoons are typically more exaggerated than the nuance of real people, and this is by design. Cartoons, especially kids' cartoons, don't have the same amount of facial detail, many of the subtleties of body language, the luxury of having the voice perfectly match the actual face of the actor. 
they have to express emotions through other means. Through an exaggerated facial expression, through symbols, through over-the-top cries and movements that would be unheard of in real conversation. When a cartoon is lying, the other characters may not know it, but the audience does. The same thing with attraction. Children's cartoons obviously have much more of these exaggerations, but adult cartoons still have a fair amount of this as well. Even some of the most nuanced, emotionally intelligent animations out there have to have some degree of exaggeration. Some people may be attracted to cartoons because they're just easier to be attracted to. Socializing with real people is a nightmare. There are so many stupid little hints and tricks and deceptions that one has to navigate through in even just a casual conversation. Like, we invented a social mechanism where we literally say something and mean the opposite of what we are saying. Cartoons take these social devices and basically distill them into something much more digestible. Cartoons are just more honest than people. It's easy to make fun of people who edit cartoon characters in with them in photos or purchase body pillows or any other number of cringy things. And I mean, it is funny, like I'm not gonna sit here and pretend it isn't, but at some level, I understand, you know? There's been points in my life where I didn't have friends, I didn't really want friends, but I would see some dudes having a fun adventure on TV and I would be like, man, I kind of want to hang out with them, even for just a day. But that day may come. I still think we have some time before we really start to blur the line between fiction and reality. And you may be wondering how one can even blur that line. Well, technology is an unpredictable thing, but I think there may come a time when our fictional worlds become so detailed, so immersive, and so real that, you know, how can you say it isn't? What if a computer program with VR capabilities could create a world full of people and places that have the same amount of detail as ours right now? A place where you can sit on a digital beach, feel wind and hear waves, pick up a handful of sand, and realize that there really is hundreds of thousands of grains in it, just like the world you think you know is real. Obviously, this is not some groundbreaking idea. People have explored this concept in more detail than me before, however, it might be coming sooner than you realize. I don't see technological progress in creating believable fictional worlds slowing down. There's at least one dimension of immersion that has been explored to its extremes, and that is time. When you expand the time experiencing a work, you inherently make it more immersive, in a sense. It becomes less a brief escape, and more like a routine. Something expected from day-to-day -day life. That's not to say length makes the quality of that immersion better, but there's certainly more potential for emotional attachment. Films on average have not actually gotten much longer in the over a hundred years we've been making them, even though a lot of popular blockbuster runtimes have seemed to be expanding. TV shows typically have more time to spend developing characters and so people often get more attached to them. Video games and the internet provide even more potential for lengthier projects. You have music projects like the Caretakers Everywhere at the End of Time, whose meditation on progressing dementia demands that runtime for its payoffs. And less artful collections of clips and music that lasts 10 hours, even half a day long podcasts. And in the realm of video games, a game that lasts anything less than 3 hours is considered pretty short. And sandbox and survival games especially have the potential for players to spend hundreds or thousands of hours on. I have a special bond with Minecraft that I don't have with any other shorter game, simply because I've spent probably close to 500 hours on it throughout my life. We even have games like The Longing, which requires 400 days to complete. Now granted, you don't do much in that time, it's more of a meditation on time itself, and the gameplay is very unusual and scattered, and that kinda goes for a lot of these things. They are mostly sparse in content, of course. But the fact that it's even possible to create a piece of interactive art that takes over a year to complete in this day and age is astonishing. I think there's a case to be made that being immersed in fiction to the point you can't interact with the real world may be a real problem in the future. I mean, yeah, we sort of have that now, but I'm talking on a large scale. An epidemic. Populations of people who willingly plug themselves into the matrix to escape from the problems of our polluted, politically chaotic world. To have honeymoons with their waifus or something. And computers could make that possible. Imagine if computers could generate worlds and people for you that not even you know you wanted. 
tap into those exact deepest desires as efficiently as the lockpicking lawyer can tap into any lock on Earth. It doesn't even have to take physical sensations to get someone trapped. If artificial intelligence could create a puzzle game, for example, that was so addicting and so engaging, to the point you never got bored of it, to the point where each time you solved one immense satisfaction overcame you, wouldn't that make you as good as physically trapped in another world? Can art become so good, it's bad? Bad for your health, that is. I can imagine you're not getting that much exercise. Artificial intelligence may indeed eventually have complete control over the human species, but the funny thing is, they wouldn't even have to put up a fight.